we see an idea uh, of a gradient that occurs in our transect. So you can see a lot of the high, the public buildings are um, towards this, the left side here. And um, as you move further towards the right, it becomes more private and uh, single family housing. And here's just the um, top view. And you can see the west, uh, the west side is a lot more private, whereas the east side is a lot more public. And with relation to access, we can see these two extremes in West Campus. So we have uh, the developing area, which has lots of high density uh, apartment buildings where it's usually reserved for private residences. And then towards the west part of West Campus, we see single family residences, which are again, just private residences that don't have access uh, for the public. When looking at the natural voids in the teal transect, there's a gradient that goes from the left side with the uh, single family housing. And this gradient decreases over time with the amount of apartment complexes. And so we'd like to change that by adding more green space into the transect. And then this gradient is also seen with the human voids. Most of the human voids you see are just the sidewalks. And there's a couple more spaces with some of the apartment complexes, but it's really lacking in human voids and gathering spaces for people. Lastly, we took a look at the non-human voids. So this includes all street and parking. So you can see um, towards the east here, towards campus, there's a lot of like parking. There's a lot more like student housing. So this is one of those student housing buildings. You can see a lot of the parking spaces are located here. Whereas when you move closer to the uh, private single family housing, there's a lot less um, non-human voids and less, a lot less parking. And so that gradient that you saw in all those other images, you can see that gradient continuing in this non-human void. And lastly, this is a composite overview of all the different um, aspects of this transect. And you can clearly see that idea of a gradient occurring with um, closer to campus being more commercial and public areas. And when you move further away towards the single family housing, there's a lot more green spaces and um, we wanted to incorporate more green spaces into our housing to kind of continue that gradient, but also to bring in more nature into the space. Thank you, Austin. Sorry, give me one second. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can All see. Right. Hello, uh, my name is Austin and this is my project titled River of Green. So for my first precedent study and uh, for this assignment, I looked at the some housing by Jean Renadi and Rene and the central idea I took away from this project was the placing of green spaces. And you can see that the shifting of elements is what creates these green spaces. And this idea of terracing is one that I incorporated into my own project. My next precedent study was on the Kuriyama apartments by Sana. And I was impressed by their use of curves and that idea of fluidity. And I wanted to incorporate that idea of fluidity into my own project, connecting and making a fluid dialogue between um, nature and humans. And from that, I extracted the curve from um, sauna and tried to center my pro projects around that um, idea of fluidity and flowing through the spaces. And from here, I focused specifically on my endless unit and specifically the rotation. And you can see how um, the joining of elements in unity creates this river of green that flows through the space. And this is just uh, a short animation of this, the unity. Uh, and you can see how the navigation also creates that idea of like flowing through the space. You don't necessarily walk in a straight line, but you're kind of like just going as the, the space flows. And from there, I created an overview and a field. And you can see that without the navigation here, you can see the creation of courtyard spaces as well as um, this river of green that flows. And you can see that uh, a lot of the housing is not like orthogonal, but it kind of just like goes throughout the space. From there, I focused specifically and created four different units that fit into my field. And so you can see in this first 
um, image here, it shows one of the units with the internal circulation leading onto the balcony through the center. The second piece is the navigation and vertical navigation. You can see that there's a stairway leading up. This third image shows the horizontal navigation and you can, you can see how the green space is incorporated. And this last image, it's a stacked unit with um, balconies balconies on the right side. And the internal circulation is around this central cylinder here that you can see is framed by the um, apertures. This is the site that I took from, uh, that I was placing my unit on. And this is placed at the center between um, high student housing and some more private single family housing. And it's at the center of the gradient. And I chose this site specifically so that I can continue that gradient while incorporating more green space into this um, site. This is an overview of my project. And you can see uh, how it's located and how it's placed in relation to the buildings around it. Something unique about my project is that the units and the shape of the units allow for a variability. So from here, you can see like the different um, colors represent different variabilities and also different programs to an extent. So um, this is just an overview of how, how many different variabilities there are. And you can see how the units combine together to create different, um, different programmatic spaces that can be used in different ways. These are the single, single units that are a lot small, smaller as you go up, the unit sizes get larger. And lastly, this is another overview and you can see it like specifically focusing on the green spaces here um, and access. I extracted the access from my project and you can see how the access relates to the apartment units. With the public space being on the lower floor, it's not orthogonal like you would see like normal um, housing, but rather this is like a space that flows. So once again, going back to that idea of a river, you can flow through the space, not necessarily entering at a corner, but you can enter in anywhere in the space and move throughout it however you would like. This is the shared access space with um, uh, mostly located in the middle where people can go up to the different balconies that are public. And lastly, this is the private access with the interior and internal circulation that leads onto the private balconies. And this is just a general overview of all my access. And you can see how um, all the access connects with the shared leading to the private and sometimes even the private leading to the shared. This is the green spaces. And specifically what I focused on was um, that those shifting of elements that we saw in the precedent and how the shifting of elements creates these green spaces. And so you can see a lot of the public spaces are located on the lower floors where uh, with some of the public space public green spaces being located in the horizontal navigation. This shared, shared natural space is created by that terracing. And so you can see the shape of some of the units um, here. And here's some of the private. So these are the ones that are located where the navigation cannot lead to other than like the private internal navigation. So these are like the private balconies and spaces that would not be able to be accessed through the public or shared spaces. And lastly, these are the soil, and these are like where the, the flowers and pots, uh, pots of dirt would be. And here just shows all the green spaces and how they connect together. This top view shows how the green spaces like create like this, despite like on the first floor being mostly paved, um, this, this green space that you can see through this top view create like that, um, show you how much green is covering the site. This is the ground floor plan, and you can see that idea of fluidity that I tried to connect um, with, with how you can enter this space. You can enter through here, you can enter through here. You can enter through like all these different areas and not necessarily like walking along the sidewalk and then going into this space. The second, uh, the, this fourth plan, uh, fourth floor plan, you can see how um, the units relate to the balconies themselves. So you can see like there's entrances onto these spaces and uh, they provide uh, people access to these natural spaces and you can see how they connect together as well as the how the navigation horizontal navigation connects as well this is a section and i specifically took this section to show you uh, the central courtyard so you can see how this empty space um, in the center of the section you can see how the light touches the space and leaves like almost an enclosure and especially in the Texas heat, this sun, uh, 
there's only sunlight beaming down on this courtyard for a limited amount of time during the day. You can see that most of the sunlight comes through this central light well um, that is framed by the, the apartment units. Going on to these perspectives, you can see how this vertical navigation connects to the unit itself and how they flow together, as well as um, how the navigation itself becomes a place where people can stay with uh, the this wall opening up to become a seating area. This is a view of the navigation. You can see how the terracing occurs here with a, a green wall occurring um, through the shifting of elements and plants can be grown on these balconies as well. Uh, and you can see how the spaces are created through these, the flowing of the navigation. Here specifically focuses on a private balcony and how it can be accessed. And you can see how the navigation would lead up and to another navigation that would lead to another floor. Uh, however, the shifting of this navigation creates that private space and the shifting of floors within the apartment create that private space as well. This shows the second courtyard and you can see how the light penetrates the apartment units leading to the bottom floor and also being able to bring sunlight to the plants that are occurring on this lower plaza. And lastly, this render focuses on that central courtyard space um, with this communal area that is distinguished by the use of materials through the, uh, through the use of wood, as well as this central river, um, which is extracted from the shape of um, the precedent study. And you can see how the green spaces are connected here and how this would create an environment that would invite people into nature as well as um, providing a space for people to live. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. Nobody is jumping in. <laughs> Is the com comments are Please open now? Or, yeah, <laughs> maybe yes, I can start. I had the privilege the to, uh, yeah, I had the privilege to see the projects uh, in pre-final reviews. To, I feel like it's maybe easier for me to to start the short comment. Austin, I really want to commend you that you didn't stop where you were and pushed it really forward. And uh, I see uh, you really incorporated a lot of advices. So. Um, yeah, congratulations for that. It's, uh, I think, very solid proposal. I really like that you systematically thought through now this uh, network of the of the green, um, different greeneries. We call them always green, right? But they are yeah. not necessarily green. They might be also very brown and very dirty, and so on and so on. And I think that maybe you know. Uh, that you uh, arrived to this kind of uh, conclusiveness of the project. I would like to also see. Uh, you know, these renderings when they are not in this perfect sunny light, but sometimes, you know, having a different weather conditions, because that probably that what means with living with the living organisms, right? They are not necessarily always clean and, you know, not necessarily always perfected. So maybe this would be some kind of, you know, the next step for, for my position that you would uh, also consider the kind of uh, the realities that are embedded in seasonal nature of this kind of lifestyle. And I feel like you also managed to push your language forward. It somehow became, to my understanding, sort of Jean Arp uh, uh, kind of, you know, geometries. And I, I really enjoy that you, you sort of forwarded it, you know, not just to stay with the quoting of, of Sana, so to say. And I'm, um, maybe uh, what I'm thinking is, you know, like it would be even fantastic for you to get this series of seasonalities because now you or I feel like you strongly incorporated these ideas of like water, you know, and the kind of the differentiation of the scales. So yeah, from my side would be maybe a comment to really um, think, you know, how your project would unfold within the cycles of the year and within the seasonality. So yeah. maybe shortly, yeah. <laughs> Can I, can I ask a question? Is there um, any uh, information on the uh, type 
of the residential, like who, who's the audience here? Who would be the user of this apartment? Is, is this a luxury apartment, a student housing? Is there a particular, maybe I didn't get that from the brief. This is a question for me or the professor. Well, if you can answer, maybe. Oh, okay. For you, for you. All right. <laughs> Comment. Please. Yes. This is uh, both student housing, but it also like the program programmatic spaces on the first floor also are provided for the public. So they also so there's both like residential units as well as public spaces, which allow for like um, people to come in and like there's like a gym you can like study and stuff. Right. Um, I ask you because it, it might not have been at all uh, one of the issues uh, or central areas of, of research for this particular project. Um, but I think that it, it does might have an impact on the typology of housing that you're producing, right? So I, I think that your project is, 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 is very accomplished and it very, very much at the level of the field condition, the study of the field condition is very strong. Um, it's very strong in 2D, especially in the drawing that you have, the abstract drawing on the top view. It, it creates kind of a, a, a different pockets that have different scales, that, that has, that's, there's a kind of a very kind of strong sense of a multi-scalar conditions of, of public space um, or, or different pockets of space, right? But I feel like I'm, I'm skeptical of the curve. I was, you know, um, the, the project of, uh, of Sana, the Okurayama apartments has a different height as well. And, and in, I'm, I haven't done much research on the project, but it seems to me that the curve um, as much as you presented as this, uh, this resource for fluidity, I feel like that's a, there's a big pay you, uh, cost that you pay for actually uh, using this curve to the point in which I would argue that your proposal, it really goes into this kind of luxury form of or typology of luxury in a way where everything is bespoke, everything is kind of, even your windows are kind of really, uh, you know, move, moving away from any kind of, potential standardization, potential. So, so as much as we celebrate the diversity of spaces that are achieved, I feel like uh, you could have achieved some of those things perhaps in, in uh, a, with formal resources that do not incur in, in, in this uh, kind of excessive amount of uh, bespoke architecture, I think. Um, just, and, and as I'm saying this, I, I know that there is, as I mentioned initially, there might not have been a kind of economic awareness or, or kind of imperative in the brief, but I think that it's, it's, it's important to mention that the resource of the curve, as you presented, yes, it could be a resource for fluidity, but has a series of other kind of architectural implications. So I would be always kind of a bit uh, careful about when we take resources such as those ones, like uh, they might start kind of opening up the avenue for an interesting form of language, but they do have like, uh, socioeconomic implications as well. So having that aside, I think that the project it's at its best when it, it manages to create these kind of different scales of spaces. And I think that in your project, the, the, scale, the section it's central um, to really analyze and if this would be a sp spaces of quality or would, would rather be spaces of darkness and perhaps really not, not achieving some of the visions that you have in your rendering, right? Because as I mentioned initially, I think the Sana Apartments operates at a, as a much slower scale where, where these kind of smaller pockets are still able to capture light and, and using the curvature in an interesting way to kind of almost like bounce light into these, these kind of courtyards. So I, I think that uh, in, in such a larger, like in, in a much larger proposal like yours and also being much taller, um, I feel like the, the, perhaps it's difficult to be as accurate to, to make sure that some of those quarters are all kind of uh, achieving a, a kind of a degree of exposure to light that might make it a quality, a good space in a way, right? So I think that there's, um, a, as I said, it's, an, it's a very accomplished project, but it, it, I would be accurate or precise on, on trying to achieve a, more, like all the spaces to have great quality, right? And I'm sure that that's quite difficult in, in the current uh, strategy of organization. I'm gonna follow on that. I thought those were wonderful comments. Um, Austin, this is a beautiful project. I mean, it, it really is beautiful. It's very 
um, complete. The renders are alluring. Um, and I, so I'm, I was thinking a little bit along the same lines as Jose in the sense that as you're beginning to shape this, the voids are really essential. And so I was thinking that another precedent that one could study would be one from landscape. We could look at uh, Roberto Burley Marx and sort of think about the forms and the shapes that he's working with landscape with the idea that the building is almost a background or, or is a part of the language, but maybe not the primary um, concern. And I, I know we're in an architecture studio, but it's an interesting question. Am I, am I, you talked a lot about the public space, about the landscape, and really not just individual landscapes, but ones that are for the community, whether those living here or even people crossing through. So I could imagine that we might need to shape the voids and then allow the buildings to um, support some of those figures. And I think the sections for me are the most compelling and then some of the, yep. And that's where I would begin to look at light and I would think about the depth of some of these things to host the trees, the breezes that might move through and all the things that might begin to animate those spaces that are between the, the units. But really, really beautiful project. Well, well done. Thank you. So I, I jump here. Um, I think also it's a, it's a great project, especially in terms of, I think in general, the proportions, the, the plurality of grain, the scale you have, I think is very well uh, measured. Uh, there is indeed, a, what I think is, is, is a pretty interesting, although of course it could be worked more, there is a formal tension in between. Uh, sometimes the project reads more as a Roberto March landscape, no, with this fluidity. In other cases, it looks more like an assemblage of units, no? And, and this, this sort of dichotomy is, is something that for sure is a, is a point of this project. What for me anyways is, probably most interesting is the, um, the circulation that you are proposing here, no? which combines some uh, a lot of different degrees of public and private. One almost would feel like a sort of Baudelaire flaneur uh, navigating no? within this landscape as a sort of uh, juicier from, from Kulhas. And here then for sure there would be a, a other aspects that with more time you could develop. For example, uh, these sort of voyeur views that uh, seem to appear no? from, from di diagonal perspectives from, from floor to from floor. To floor. Um, then probably uh, to me, the, the, the next step, I think there are a couple of opportunities that you could emphasize. The, the first one is that uh, the greenery in general, you show it as being mainly outdoors. And I think that there could be an opportunity to explore how you could also have an, a, a, a greenery which is indoor, no? which is the relation in between these two. So there is a sort of pre-assumption in which greenery should be outside, right? And I'm sure there would be ways to explore how can it also be inside and which is the relation that can be established between both. And the second point would be how this greenery, which seems to be one of the points on which you capitalize, can be not merely contemplative, no, but it can also be productive, no. So, which is which are the the let's say resources or products that uh, you can prompt with it, no, rather than the beauty of it or the psychological um, benefits of of greenery. But yeah, um, besides these points, I think is a is a great project. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, looking at this scheme, uh, I'm wondering, uh, one of the main purposes of this studio was to explore ways of increasing green areas, right, um, to provide uh, landscaping. And so if, one, if that is one of the issues, and if uh, one is looking at uh, the problem of urban heat islands, then um, Providing shade by creating cavernous spaces, I think is uh, one way of trying to address this issue of mitigating urban heat island effects. At the same time, um, the topic that you are choosing or the, or the way that you are assembling uh, the volumes uh, maximizes the envelope to volume uh, ratio, which means that you're exposing a lot of surface to 
uh, heat. That's just one aspect. The other aspect that uh, I think needs addressing is um, uh, structure and vertical circulation. When you talk about your vertical navigation, uh, you are not providing any form of elevators, if I understood this correctly. And um, of course, if you're fit and not dependent on any other means of, you know, uh, or if you have an electric uh, wheelchair, that's okay. But if you uh, are not, and you are carrying a child or, uh, uh, you know, goods, crates of beer or something like that, up, uh, it does become a little bit wearing. So uh, with all the kind of enthusiasm that software programs uh, provide you in uh, assembling and playing around with volumes, there are some essential things that I think architecture needs to do, uh, uh, structural uh, efficiency, uh, vertical circulation, um, certain relationships also of uh, privacy. I understand that some of the uh, uh, staircases pass by other people's uh, terraces and so on. I think this is an issue. And, and you know, if, you, if you're able to walk past somebody's window, it's not something that really uh, is an ideal condition. So um, one of the reasons the architecture in West Campus looks the way it does is because it's highly economical. Right, it's cheap. Uh, one of the reasons why it doesn't look the way that your scheme looks is because your scheme is going to be extremely expensive. So um, where are you going to stand in terms of, you know, um, on the one hand, maximizing uh, volume to um, oh, uh, envelope to, to volume uh, exposure, uh, and uh, trying to achieve this kind of cavernous space um, with some landscaping. Uh, I mean, in, in the history of architecture, you know uh, Walsha Safdie's uh, Habitat, right? Uh, have you seen that? Habitat 67. Yeah, have, you've seen that, right? And yeah. You've probably also seen Ricardo Bullfield's Walden 7 and all those kinds of uh, heroic... Uh, cavernous spaces of the, uh, of the 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, I mean, there were, there, there were pretty s great struggles to achieve those kinds of things uh, as well. Um, and, and yet, um, when it comes to the quality of uh, inhabitation, uh, I don't think that they were great. I think your space and your section uh, looks quite, um, I think quite uh, positive. Um, I think that's one of the strongest parts of your scheme. Uh, you know, having said that, uh, all the other issues are pretty fundamental and um, I think you need to address them. Structure, circulation, uh, privacy. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Um, great comments. Um, from my side was a bit to the studio. Maybe I forgot to mention, I set up a studio that it's um, reaching five or six floors. So some students embedded the elevator, some students um, I let more establish the uh, widening navigation and the access and turning this into communal gathering spaces. So that was from my side regarding the elevator, just to further projects, uh, very good comments. Slightly I disagree about the curve being expensive because earlier times of Mustishap, the, the Mustishap uh, habitat is was other types of technology we have. And I think it's uh, not using the technology today and not using uh, innovation or 3D printing is offering us and maybe the curve is even cheaper than the sharp edge. I think so. So, um, but I really thank you, thanks to everyone for very nice insights. Not every part are embraced perfectly, but a project of Austin, I um, congratulate you on in choosing the river of green uh, of the flow of the human void to research on those topics and to learn from um, the final proposal issues within the reviews and comments. 
we learn a lot from it. Thank you so much. We would like to move on to the, our next uh, project. Yasha, would you like to share your screen, please? Yes. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can see it very well. So my name is Yashna Gongo, and my project Branching Out is a project that tries to improve the human space to create a more community gathering area, but this also incorporates a lot of green area to improve West Campus. So for my president study, I was looking at John Renaudi and Remy Dalhousted's housing units in France. And from the study, I really enjoyed the geomet geometrical shapes that he used to incorporate the green space. So I tried to take the angular green space, but also the geometries in the units. So from there, I was looking at um, different unit designs to aggregate. So I had the plates, the rooms, and the endless. And so I looked at my plate units for rotation because from these studies, uh, the walls would create different types of views and also privacy for the terraces. And so here's the field aggregation as it rotates and expands, then branches out, creating and expanding this free form and free spaces. And then I also use my unit rotation to create spaces for people to live in. And so I tried to combine them to create the living space, but also vertical circulation that will be available to the public. And so here, there's different types of navigation throughout. There are the ramps, the stairs, and then there's the stairs with the plate units. And so here, you can see it rotate. And here's also the field aggregation of this. So with this, the plates uh, allow for the units to expand and freeform branch out, creating different units. And so here are my updated units with the roomings and then my plate navigation with the greenery and a vertical garden for people to access. And so my site on West Campus is located in the box. I wanted to take away the, I just wanted to reduce the building footprint, but also create a more community for the public to access. And so here is my perspective of the whole aggregation. And so at the bottom floor is more for the public, is for cafes and retails and just people to walk through and get away from the city. Here are the single units. So the unit itself is two floors, but each floor will be available for one person to live or however many need to. Here are the full units. So the unit itself is on its own. And then here are the clusters where the units are combined. As for navigation, uh, the bottom floor it has ramps. It goes up to the stairs, and then there are the plate navigation of the stairs. But the difference is with those stairs, there are whole plates for people to access and to roam around and enjoy the greenery in the scenes. But there's also elevators for direct access. For the green voids, I have public green voids at the bottom for people to enjoy and walk around. Then this shared green is part of the navigation. And then the private green is all the terraces that go along with the room units. And here are the trees that allow it kind of close it off from unit uh, from West Campus, but it's more invitational to the public to allow people to get away. And so at the top view, if you see all these green spaces, it really covers up the whole uh, site. And I think that really increases the green space and improves the area for West Campus. For my plan, you can see the units and then you can also see the plates. And so the way people would access is you'd go through these stairs and for the units on this floor, you can access through the terrace here. But for some of the units on the other floors, you can go through the back, which isn't seen here. For the section, you can see the height of the whole uh, project and the branching out of the plate navigation happens on the upper floors, which also creates a shaded area on the bottom for people to get away from the heat during the day. And so through the renters, you can see this is the 
bottom floor with some people entering. So this is where the garden at the bottom is. There's also seating areas and public spaces for people to go to. As you go up the ramps, you can see the units go up and you can see the green throughout. Here is a view of all the navigation units. And so here you can see the way the plates have been rotated. People are able to walk through and enjoy the greenery and the views along with the shade. And then here is the green botanical garden at the plate unit focus. And then this is also the very top. And so through this project, I created this vertical green navigation and garden that's available to the public, which creates a more a larger sense of community through West Campus and creates a breathing space from the dense density of West Campus. That's it. Thank you, Ashna, for presentation. I'm I'm trying to locate it on the Moreau board. What it what is the name of this again? I'm sorry. Uh, branching out. Branching out. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna jump in. Um, maybe I'll I'll do a different line of uh, comment. I think that because I'm looking at the mirror board and I'm looking at every, everything, I think that many of the comments in regards to the scale of of public space and pockets, and I guess the cavernous, as was described, um, kind of nature of some of the building, might really apply to several projects. Um, I wanted to discuss in, in your project specifically. Um, to some of the design decisions in regards to materiality. Um, and, and also, as, as it allows to register different formal systems, right, that, that seem to be complementary to each other, right? Meaning specifically the units, um, I would even argue that some of the handrails using a kind of a different kind of, you know, metallic detail, as well as the kind of wooden uh, structure in, in, two, in two different forms of wood, I guess. Um, one being kind of the, the, the circulation uh, and then also like the, the staircase specifically having this kind of much, much more different tone. And I think that um, I mentioned these things uh, or bring them, bring some attention to them because I think that those are the, the kind of the vocabulary or the resources that you're using to kind of create some uh, delineation, some kind of articulation of the whole uh, on the project. Uh, uh, and I think that the project is, is so dynamic and so 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 strong and so graphic that I feel like some of those uh, materials could have been used to, to a kind of a, uh, an even further degree. Meaning that um, the way the the relationships between sometimes the housing unit might be able to incorporate right uh, wooden elements uh, kind of blend or blur the, the distinction between circulation elements and, and housing elements. And, and similarly, um, the way in which handrails could become, you know, details in the building. Those are, I think, uh, opportunities that I feel like maybe are exploited uh, very little in the project. Uh, and I wish there, there, there was kind of a less of an indexical uh, use of materials for representing the parts, right? Like the different components or different systems that already con constitute the building. And, and there would have been a little bit more integration or kind of um, blurring the, the definition of what are these different subsystems that constitute the whole. Um, I mentioned this because as I said, I think it's a, it's a strongly, it's a very strong proposal. Um, I really love the way in which the overlaps creates an incredible amount of dynamism. Um, I'm specifically looking at the slide. Uh, it's one of the bird's eye view. Um, and I really like the use of the material. And I wish that would be like a little bit more, uh, there would be more mixed, right? There would be more of a blurring of these different kind of uh, systems that are very well established in your case by color coding them in a way, right? I would if like I can to connect. Oh, sorry, please. Oh, I was just going to jump in on a, a following that. Um, uh, I, I, for me, it's easier to focus on the smaller details in this project, partly because like the top floor seems to be flying. So I'm not sure about that. But I like this notion of looking at these smaller details because 
Um, if we look at, you know, I like uh, Herman Hertzberger and some of the small moments that he does to begin to create uh, social connections, uh, sort of thresholds between um, the individual and the community at different scales. And it seems like yours is very much also has is very much part of the architecture. Those small moments could be um, fostered in a way to begin to describe the structure or the possibilities of how we might live in this. And so there, there's less of a catalog of finding things, but more of a programming of these things and beginning to tune them and shape them in the way that they perform um, as a social sort of condensers or activators. So that'll be my comment. I was intending to shortly connect to what uh, Jose said before, maybe from even uh, sort of uh, stepped back position. I see, uh, Yasha, you worked very hard the last weeks and you kind of defined, you, you articulated very strongly um, the project from what I've seen before. But I was wondering because the, the language that you're using for greenery and so to say for living quarters, um, on geometrical level, they are basically the same. And I'm wondering, you know, if that kind of um, layer of abstraction that I believe that was addressed through materiality now, the beautiful comment before, you know, that if you would have had kind of a layer that would allow the connectivity throughout um, your um, areas of functions and blur the kind of clarity, you know, what is now the, the, the pot of the flower and what is the interior of the room and what is the circulation and what is the green lawn, you know, somehow to, to sort of step back and abstract from it that would allow more freedom and more sort of ambiguity in how, um, how these spaces are used, right? Because now you are very, very strict in the rendering, but also in a way assigning the functions. And I feel like if I understand right, I interpret the comment before, you know, that was beautiful about the materiality. And I feel like it connects very much in thinking how people would inhabit that, you know, how they would live and how these things probably, you know, start to spill out in a way. So somebody would drop something over the fence, you know, of the private garden to the circulation uh, part, or maybe you had this uh, more interiorized rendering, you know, the, the things on the stairs would start to pile up and you know the flowers would not stay in that corner specifically and i think this kind of thinking of you know the daily routines and realities would allow you to sort of self interrogate the kind of um, the the cleanness and the uh, like the zoning of what you, what you have done Otherwise, I, I um, yeah, I stay with my compliments from before that, you know, the, the abstract system that you have, I really like your, your, your sensibilities. And there is so much airiness in those um, formal studies that you did initially. And I think that some of them gets lost or overly um, articulated and defined in the last proposition. So. Yeah, connecting connecting to with with this comment, um, I would say that in the project there is a, a lot of attention to the relation in between the individual and the community, which I think is something that is transversal to all the projects here. is very clear. Um, it's true that this this tension or, or this attention to the to the in between the individual and the community is achieved or it is is developed mainly <laughs> through geometrical tools, no? Uh, through geometrical, let's say. Um, Attributes. What I would say is that since your project uh, capitalizes so much in the in the green and, and also connecting with this kind of um, strict separation between what's green and what is not green, probably the instrumentalization of the greenery in order to um, help to establish relations with the individual and the community could be one of the manners to 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 blur these these lines. And of course, this good would demand to pay more attention to the specificities of the different species that you are uh, putting here, no? to really understand uh, what exactly do they need, how do they evolve over time, how, how, how do they grow. No? So to, to really make a catalog of the different species that you're putting here. And as soon as you probably, as soon as you realize about the complexity that each one of them demands, um, probably the project in itself will 
will start blurring these these lines, and this is for sure an opportunity to 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 capitalize even more in what I think is the main point of this proposal, at least from a sociological point of view, which is to work uh, very much this 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 um, this tension between the individual and the and the community. You know, because of course, in 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 the case of proportions, grain and scale, it's it's a super well resolved exercise. So congratulations for that. I think if you are uh, exploring the possibilities of uh, close packing versus loose packing um, as a way of creating interstitial spaces, uh, uh, cavernous spaces, um, things like uh, cross ventilation, um, shading, etc., then um, that's, I think, one dimension of architectural research uh, that's worth pursuing. Um, if you're also interested in spatial variety, and that's one thing, um, but what I see here is more an uh, uncontrolled um, heaping up of different forms. And I have to say that because I don't understand that there is any kind of geometric uh, regulation whatsoever in uh, the orientation of any of these volumes. So, you know, while, while one can sort of play around with these things, the key issue is, uh, you know, if, if we have climate, uh, a climate crisis, and if we are uh, architects trying to propose alternatives to the boring boxes, how are we uh, validating the approaches that we are pursuing? And one of the approaches is to say, okay, yeah, we want, uh, we want variety, special variety. We, want, we don't want these boring boxes. That's fine. If at the same time, the special variety leads to things like cross ventilation, shading, and things like that, that's fine as well. Uh, then I think you owe uh, uh, the public, uh, not just the developer, but the public at large, an explanation on what the parameters are uh, on which you actually are valid uh, validating your approach. And um, I come back to this issue of um, maximum surface uh, area to uh, volume. Uh, maximum circulation area to, you know, exposed uh, perimeter. Uh, and uh, that explains very simply the reason why these things don't come about. They are not efficient and they do not convince people. So um, I, I think that really um, in the long term, I think it's all fine to uh, be ex ex um, interested in issues of loose packing uh, for the purpose of spatial variety and uh, for creating shading and things like that and cross ventilation. But really, I think you have to address, unfortunately, the conventional parameters of construction and to prove that what you're proposing is actually uh, an improvement, it's uh, economically feasible and uh, is actually a controlled piece of design. And I'm afraid it isn't. I'm afraid this is just a kind of an assembly of, uh, of volumes uh, twisted and turned um, in any way. And uh, for me, that's um, unfortunately not how uh, we can uh, pursue architecture. Thank you for our comments and thank you, Yashna, for that beautiful intention to widen the access and to turn this into the public park, botanical park, social park. That's amazing and it's very successful. And also rather estimating this in the certain parameters and the certain restrictions, you really very, very nicely actually created a park as a as a forest rather than, and you gave that entity to the neighborhood, to the outside, which such entities doesn't exist. So if you go back to the image and show in a transact, which you showed already, you don't have to go back. What we do with those projects, we do not uh, estimate specific entity housing. We're searching a lot of in-betweens and that variability and branching out the aspect is not to have a parametric decisions how the architecture should look, 
but very opposite, to bring the forest in the existing content in the West Campus, turn those entities into the park, and find the other social aspects, socialized aspects to live, to spend the free time together, to go up, because there is no ground left anymore in these West Campus. Great project, thank you very much. We need to continue the second, um, our third project from Rohan Sirapella. Thank you very much for the comments. And we will have our third project, which relates to the teal transact analysis. And um, please share your presentation with us, Rohan. Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Rohan Saripala and my project is Bridging uh, Greenscapes and it is a housing project that uh, aims to improve the quality of dense living in West Campus. And for my precedent, I was looking at Akuriyama Apartments by Sana Architects. And one thing that I was uh, impressed with about this project is how they utilize this curve to facilitate circulation, as you can see here and here but also how they have these flat edges or flat faces, which face onto the street uh, to allow views into the city. And uh, they also have uh, included circulation within the, the core of the building. And then dissecting the, uh, the unit, uh, I was still impressed with like these, these apertures right here, which face out into the city. And then that circulation, which brings people uh, to the different levels. And so from the precedent, I developed three units uh, between the plates, the rooms, and the endless. And for the plates, uh, with relation to green, uh, green spaces, the green spaces occur where that disconnect uh, happens or where these units don't overlap. And between the rooms, the green space occurs where the units overlap. And between the endless aims to create uh, a series of spaces uh, bound by the circulation. And then I ended up pursuing the, the rooms unit, uh, but incorporating green space onto the top and uh, the circulation within that curve of the, of the unit. And then going back to the transect analysis, uh, looking at the access, we can see that there, there are two extremes when it comes to uh, the building types. Uh, we have the, the high density towards the east side and the low density to, towards the west side. And then looking at the space in between or the area in between is uh, a space where I thought would be a good place for new development to arise, which can improve uh, living in West Campus. And so I chose the site where the Northeast corner is on Pearl Street and 22nd Street. And the block uh, in itself is just a series of condos without any real unity or cohesiveness with relation to uh, urban living. And then the main goal of my project was to improve this human void condition. So in West Campus, within these high density buildings, we see very little space dedicated uh, towards human living or recreation or restaurants or cafes uh, uh, specific to the residential uh, units. And then so from my animation, I, I used that, that curve on the unit as, a, as an axis for these units to rotate and start to interact with each other. And looking at a primitive plan of these aggregation of units, one of the big issues was that uh, while it does have that vertical circulation embedded within that curve, I, I was struggling to find a way to have a horizontal circulation or uh, a way for people to move around within each floor. And so uh, my strategy was to uh, include a bridge which connected the two faces of the units that connect to each other and then have an optional extension to, uh, to improve the width of that uh, bridge. And this bridge also becomes a space for urban gardening or just a space where people can relax or sit next to plants in nature. And then I developed a few apartment typologies uh, deriving from that single unit. So from here, I have the single unit and then the stacked unit, which is uh, connected through a centralized uh, circulation. And then uh, started looking at when these two apartments start to interact to create a bridge between the two, and then looking at three units stacked together. And then uh, these are a few of the, the, the living situations or architectural situations that came about from this animation and figuration. And so, uh, we see a few where they start connecting together because of their proximity to each other. Uh, 
in, in this uh, uh, aggregation as well. And then looking at when two units have faces that connect to each other um, and are stacked and just going through these uh, topologies. And then we get to ones where you have three units stacked, two units stacked, and then just the, the single units. And then uh, I wanted to improve the public ac access to apartments because usually in West Campus, they don't have any space for the public to walk through and you see these very private uh, apartments. And so I wanted to uh, incorporate the bottom units as restaurants and cafes, which are open to the public to improve uh, public living in West Campus. And then looking at the green space, by including the, the roof, the roofscape as green spaces, uh, the, the amount of green space already gets increased. And then connecting these, I have the bridges, and these are the bridges incorporated within the building. And then isolating the circulation, which is embedded within the unit, and then connecting it all together to form uh, the building massing. And then looking at the bird's eye view, you can start to see these green spaces uh, either as bridges or as roofscapes uh, where people can access, relax, uh, and just be closer to nature in general. And then from the bird's eye view, I was really uh, going back to the Kuriyama apartments about the apartment uh, apartments facing the street. I wanted to incorporate that, but also like multiply that as well. And so you can see different situations where uh, the apartments face out onto the street, but if they're not facing out into the street, they face inside. And that's where these bridges start to appear and these connected living situations occur. And then looking at the plan, uh, I also wanted to embed the trees within the apartment so that it takes living with trees to like another level, like you are actually with the trees and it's not just some outside entity. And then you can also start to see the, the bridges, which are places for gardening or uh, sitting and relaxing. And then you can see the, the apartments which face out become more private and then the ones that face each other become uh, uh, possibilities for connections and uh, different, different living situations. And in the plan, you can see that tree within the apartment as well, but also the, the public walkthrough through the bottom and then the spaces for cafes, uh, public seating, lounge areas. And then you can also see uh, situations at the top where two units connect. And then you have this uh, garden in between the space or a courtyard condition. And this perspective shows the, the ground condition and the space where people can relax or enjoy coffee, uh, but this is all open to the public, so not just the residents are limited to the space. And then in the bedroom itself, the, the tree which uh, occurs from the bottom or appears from the bottom floor into the top floor uh, allows you to live with trees uh, inside and outside of the apartment. And then to conclude, I was uh, really looking at this human void in the green space, and this is uh, the existing voids and then through my project I uh, sought to improve this condition and incorporate more human spaces, bridges, and uh, places where people can relax and hang out. Thank you. Thank you, Rohan. Well, let's just try to break that a bit of an upward silence now. Um, so I, I want to, more than, more than a comment specifically to the project, I, I, I wanted to kind of um, maybe go back. I was kind of taken by Wilfred's last comment in regards to the previous project. And also, which can probably apply for maybe a few projects that we've seen. Um, and I want to I wanna discuss maybe the role of representation as well in this project. The way I, I kind of, review and see the work 
uh, as interesting and powerful has to do centrally of really looking at this as a, an academic exercise, right? One in which we are kind of conceptualizing different approaches towards building, maybe leaving certain variables aside versus and, and kind of envisioning what kind of possibilities of spaces and living could, could occur uh, on, on a project such as this one. And I think that in, in that regard, the, the brief and the project that we're seeing have uh, an incredible value, right? Of course, if we kind of front load all the requirements for such proposals to be executable within the field of architecture, I think we would have, uh, you know, we can point out to all the shortcomings of the building. So in, in a way it kind of makes me reflect of why can we celebrate some conditions versus really um, not acknowledging certain uh, shortcomings. And I think that uh, I really go back to the problem of representation. I think that some of the confusion of this academic exercise potentially could be about its communication. And I think that because most of the students are using a very, very realistic form of representation, maybe this one slightly less so, um, trying to play with this idea of that this is a physical model, but still using very a strong sense of realism um, towards the depiction of spaces, uh, it, it does kind of try to present itself as a kind of a realistic depiction of a building. And I think that that's kind of, um, that's what I, I would say it's potentially a flaw that, that doesn't allow us to kind of really conceptualize some of the strong moves, syntactical or spatial that are achieved as more of in, in the context of an academic um, right. exercise, right? So I, I wish maybe the representation was less, and, and I'm, I'm not a big fan at all of the kind of the preset kind of aesthetic that comes from things like Lumion and, and I don't know, Enscape and some of these engines, but I think that just being able to have a distance to the work um, and understanding it in its pursuit of syntax and typology and a series of kind of architectural conditions that are certainly valuable. Um, I think that we can definitely kind of find uh, strong moments here um, and in the project that we've seen before. But I, I think I, I wanted to say that because it felt like at some point we, we might be able to critique all the projects as not being able to really uh, conform to a kind of a tradition of practice in a way, um, or, or the kind of accumulated knowledge that practice already has for a viable building. So um, that felt important to me. I'm, I'm not averse to, uh, to uh, leaving well-trodden paths or boring paths of uh, conventional practice. Uh, I'm all for it. You know, I think that, for example, the designs of Shahun for housing have been quite interesting and, um, there are others who are trying to work very hard on this topic. But, you know, when you see uh, an early, early example of, uh, I mean, where the issue of privacy, just for example, the, the topic of privacy came up. When Herzog de Maron designed a, a linear block, a linear interior apartment unit where there were C-shaped plans stacked on top of each other with windows facing uh, the light well. Mm -hmm. I think that's highly problematic. You view from one living room into the other bedroom, up and, up and down. The result is curtains most of the time, right? So you get some direct indirect light from the light well, that's all very well. But the notion of this openness that the plan suggests uh, is completely uh, subverted by the fact that uh, they haven't really given any thought to the the problem of privacy in reality. Now, you, we can look at all these schemes from that point of view. I've mentioned it as a principle. Um, we can look at the point of view uh, just conventionally uh, and even not conventionally in terms of structure. We can look at it from the point of view of you know, convenience of access. Uh, but uh, most importantly, we can look at it from the point of view, what is the spatial quality that we achieve and it's interesting that most of the schemes that we've seen present the uh, projects from an aerial perspective. We don't see any views from the inside of a unit into one of the voids. And we certainly don't see it with the realistic lighting quality, right? So uh, the fact is that a, a lot of these units at the lower level are going to be quite dark of course, because there are, there are units stacked up on top. So the question is, 
you know, we have all these tools, SketchUp and all these other, uh, you know, Rhino and Grasshopper, whatever they're called, and we can model all these things and we can have fun, all right? And we can ignore things like structure, circulation, you know, and, and, and all those kinds of things. But the, the question is, what do you learn? And if the premise is with, you know, I agree with the premise, let's get away from boring boxes. Let's have more cross ventilation, natural cross ventilation. Let's have more vegetation. Let's have more green, right? And if we want to plant trees, we know that the slabs have to be, you know, pretty strong and that the soil that you need to keep trees alive has to be pretty deep, right? So if we take on these things as, as part of the design parameters, I'm all on board, but let's try and work them out and not just stack things on top like you know three-dimensional playing cards and then say render so following following with this comment i think that a moment of the presentation that is i think is emblematic of of his discussion is uh, at the very beginning there is a moment where the units in plan are rotating in a sort of movement and that's to be more uh, lateral or free. Uh, probably this is the moment when to cross this geometrical movement um, with other variables uh, relating to, to construction, to structure, to, to light, uh, that would be one step to, 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 to give more solidity from, from this other point of view to the proposal. Uh, beside, this, beside this comment uh, that of, of how to cross this geometrical movement with other architectural variables. Um, there is something more specific uh, of this project in relation to others, which is that uh, the units, they're not only, let's say, accumulated or stuck, but in between them, they establish uh, certain deformations or certain local complicities, no? which is what you refer with the term bridge. Um, so I, I would say that then the, 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 the thing, that the next step would be that if, if this idea of bridge is thing which is more specific of this proposal, what we see now is that this bridge is a sort of um, hermetic corridor. No? So uh, one of the probably opportunities for, for next development would be that if this is indeed something that somehow um, specifies your proposal, I would celebrate this moment uh, way more no? in all the manners that you could celebrate it and, and, and I would convert it in one of the pillars of your of your approach, yeah. Thank you. I was going to talk a little. Bit. Can we go to the um, overhead view, Rohan? Yes. Um, uh, not not a bird's eye, but a little bit more directly down. This one. I'm um, looking down. I don't. I have it on concept board. It's the one above the section. Yeah. Great. Great. Um, this is a really interesting view for me because I begin to um, see the different types of voids that are being created and these um, sort of bridging spaces that are beginning to shape those voids. And so um, I, I'm, I'm particularly intrigued with that. So, you know, if I, I can begin to see this space, but I understand that this is a semi-public space that is beginning to join or beginning to shape that space here. It's a little bit more problematic only in the sense that these, these pieces are filling that space, right? So there's your right. courtyard. But it's very interesting to me that your, your figural, your spaces could be figural spaces begin to either receive um, the context around it like this, or begin to create an interior, um, exterior space. But I do, I do, I am interested in the bridges and how they might actually begin to support those local um, communities. Does right. that make sense? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, I, I mean, in your project, I, it's, I could imagine that as you're going through the process, there are probably many moments that look pretty exciting, right? I mean, I, mm -hmm. I could imagine, right? I mean, I, I, it's sort of fun, right? It's like you're, 
you're eating all the candy. And so the trick is to, I, for me, is to decide at what point do I stop? And then how do I evaluate that moment? And, and so I begin to fold in at that point, um, some of these contextual concerns, like how does it relate to the site or light or things like that. And, and I think in yours, it would be almost a process of editing or tuning, maybe moving a few of these things to really begin to accentuate these spaces um, within the project. Right. So, but I, 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 I really appreciate the evolution and um, I think I think there are some nice contextual responses here. Thank you. My quick comment after many inputs you got, I think that one of the interesting parts of your project that you addressed um, is the typologies of apartments, as you called. And I think this yes. is the place where you could have um, really discussed more or give, give us more ideas what kind of a lives and uh, what kind of communities and what kind of citizens you envision living here. And right. I think that could nicely complement um, the critique that is being posed, of course, as an overall, you know, with this kind of idea of the privacy or the, the demand of the, uh, of the understanding, um, you know, the kind of spatial qualities of living together. And I think that here would be very, very great opportunity for you to really work out, you know, these uh, sensibilities because the privacy, to my understanding, also needs to be defined, you know, and needs to be proposed. It's a very cultural notion. And I'm pretty sure you are experts of where you are living in every country I've seen and visited and all these uh, seminal projects we know they might have failed or they proposed something that was completely reversed in their, in, in their effects. But I must uh, really, I think that as an architect's role, you know, you need to propose something. And I think that you here have a great opportunity, you know, to orchestrate these relationships within those types of the apartments or the units that you um, showed. And I think that kind of nicely fits with the previous comment that if you were to fine tune a bit, you know, with this pers perspective of, of resident or these types, um, you kind of would um, give a post-rationalized kind of um, go for, for all the scheme, you know, um, it would give another strength for, for, for your proposition, which I think has a lot of to offer. And it feels almost to me at the time that it could have, you know, a bigger, like bigger scale, like the units either I would scale them down almost in the site or even give them bigger site, you know, to, in the relationship to the city, for example, or in the relationship to the street, right? Because it seems mm -hmm. that it's kind of exploding almost if, out of, of the site. And it means that not necessarily to be pushed back, but to really consider carefully and with, uh, with respect what you identified in your project um, reference from Sana. You know, how mm -hmm. the building negotiates the neighboring building, how it negotiates the street side and how it um, um, invites you to the interior of, of the building itself, if we talk about the entire site. Yeah, but otherwise, thank you for a beautiful presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Um, we have a last group, uh, not last and not least, our orange transect analysis uh, and two more projects uh, referring to the West Campus uh, neighborhood and trying to give a kind of additional entity back to the city, to the neighborhood, rather than being just a density in itself. Great, uh, Ben and Jordan, could you please share your presentation yes can you all see it please start Perfect. yes okay see it. so we had the orange transect and the orange transect runs along 24th street from uh, guad which is close to campus all the way to lamar which is near the highway um, and the first thing we did was can you guys see that there we go okay uh, the first thing we did was analyze all of the program of west campus and we made these dot diagrams to really just analyze the variety and actually the lack of variety within West Campus 
Um, so you can see the majority of West Campus is uh, residential, which is this red dot, and it's a high density residential. So it's those high rises. And then you have your retail and food mainly only along Guad. Um, and those are smaller density areas. And the second diagram we did was about public versus private spaces. And as you can see, most of the public spaces lie on Guadalupe Street, as well as 24th, which is the main east to west thoroughfare throughout West Campus. And the green dots show, green and yellow show semi-private and private, whereas the blue show public and restri restricted public. So that would be all the public spaces on Guad, our restaurants and things like that. And then as you move into private and semi-private, those are the larger buildings and smaller condo complexes. So this is our transects. Um, again, 24th Street runs through the center of it. And then this is Guadalupe and this is Lamar. So campus is over here and everything is color coded. Um, and if we zoom in, you can see the main, uh, main like pattern that happens throughout the transects is the green slowly starts to fade away as you get closer to campus. And that's just because of property values. And as buildings get bigger, they take up more um, square footage um, and then you have less green areas. So that was a main issue we were gonna try to explore um, and fix within the transects. This diagram shows the same thing but in elevation form as well. And you can see how it slopes down as you get further west on our transect, which is where most of the green uh, lies. And down there, you also have the creek that runs through Peace Park. So there's way more green on that side. And as you move towards campus, you can see it's just more public shared spaces. Um, this diagram shows access. So most of the access, or it shows void space and access. And most of the access is just meant for getting from point A to point B. Um, it's not really any type of recreational access or any um, unique access. It's just very standard. Um, and this one shows all the void spaces. So natural void, which is the green, and human void, which is the blue. So this just further accentuates that east to west idea that there is there that all of the spaces on the east side are gonna be more human void and natural void as you move west. And that's what we wanted to bring in more of that natural void towards the east side of the transect. And then here's just access by itself. And again, you can see that very standard access getting from point A from point B. Um, which we also tried to resolve in our projects. And then if we go back to a plan view, we can annotate uh, my project is right here in this area, a very non-human, non-green uh, space. And mine, I don't know, annotation is not working for me for some okay. reason. Is it right here? Yes. Okay. Mine is right there, which is an empty lot at the moment. Thank you. Ben, could you please start with your presentation? Yes. Um, one second. Okay. Okay, can you all see the screen? Okay, perfect. All right, my name is Ben Meyer. I appreciate you all I'll be here this afternoon to hear our presentations. And I titled my project Urban Greenscape, and here's just a quick sneak peek of the final proposal. And my personal goal for the project was to find a way to vertically incorporate a recreation um, nature-filled park environment within a living condition. Um, so I want to start off by presenting two influential precedents I studied in the beginning of the semester. The first one was Alexander Road by Nate Brown in London, and I was inspired by the arrangements of units in relationship to the main path of access, which becomes more of a recreational element. And the second precedent uh, was Nama Parks by Stefan Berry in Japan. 
And when dissecting the project, I found the logic behind the integration of circulation and green space to be very intelligent. And I extracted the system in a single element, which you can see here highlighted in yellow. And this element is rotated and repeated throughout the project in various ways. So this, uh, these two precedents inspired me to explore ideas involving the layering of multi-purpose elements and the idea of recreational access. So we used Unity to explore these relationships using simplified geometries within architectural proportions. And this study that you're seeing here now had the most impact on my project moving forward. Um, logically, the element is made up of two components that rotate on a central pivot, generating unique terracing conditions. And then when stacked vertically, um, each element is, sorry about that. Um, each element is, um, is attached through a hinge condition that ensures an endless access throughout the arrangements. And then this effect is multiplied um, uh, when placed into a field, generating a whole system of green terracing and access, still maintaining that functional um, architectural concepts. And then this was the main goal I had within this stage of development. And that goal was to develop a sound logic that would create variability formally while still maintaining complete functionality of the elements arrangement. Um, so this goal led me to this final element. Um, this element consists of multiple units surrounded by an endless loop of circulation and ramps. And the circulation is meant to be, form, uh, be a form of recreation for the residents, like in Alexander Road. And it's also offset away from the units to ensure a level of privacy, um, transparency, and airflow. So within this offset, I placed a vegetation buffer to incorporate an aspect of nature along the paths that also doubles as a privacy barrier for the residents. And there's a consistent logic embedded within the elements aggregation that's similar to the original geometric study. So each pod of the units is connected by a hinge condition that allows the form to become fluid in its aggregation while still allowing the circulation to remain true. And then when these sub elements hinge, the roofs of the units are exposed, allowing for a thick layer of soil to be placed on top. And this generates a green space. And then the rails would be removed, allowing for direct access flowing out from the ramps into the parks created. And no matter how these elements um, aggregate, the endless loop of circulation still remains um, constant and is still functional. And the units themselves also rotate within the sound logic. So each unit is divided into two rings that are able to rotate within control constraints. Um, so here's like before the rotation, and then here's after the rotation, an example of it. And by setting up this system, light and air are able to reach that central core and the level of variability of unit arrangement is also established. And then in addition, when these uh, units overlap, private green spaces are generated, as you can see here, um, for the residents to enjoy. Um, and again, even though there's this internal rotation, everything still stays functional. Um, and here's an animation of that happening. It's not the final detailed uh, unit, but it still shows um, how that would work. So this is the single unit, and then here's a vertical stack, and you can see how those effects are multiplied, um, and those terraces are created. And then here is a entire field of those units, and this is how my massing for my projects uh, was formed. So um, that was all the logic within the project, project's aggregation, and now I'm going to move on to the final proposal. So I chose a site located on the corner of Guad and 25th to tackle the lack of green and human space within the east side of West Campus. And Guad, like mentioned before in the transect analysis, is the border between UT's campus and West Campus. So this location provided me a way to extend the green of UT into West Campus. And I decided to extend the project to cover the majority of the block. But within the project, I incorporate these commercial buildings back in. Um, so here's just an aerial view of the pro final proposal that shows the overall massing of the system. And you can start to see the network of circulation and the greenscapes integrated into the massing that was formed directly from that aggregation and rotation. Um, there's two commercial pods dug into the site right here and right here. Um, and that incorporates those businesses back into the project that were initially removed. And there's lots of layers to this project. So I'll start to unpack them. So this is the top view of the park being formed and it creates an entire level of green spanning multiple levels, providing spaces for nature and the residents to enjoy. And there's also a pool integrated into the top of one of the pods oriented towards the greenery generated, as well as providing a view of UT's campus. Um, I also wanna point out how using a circular more organic form 
breaks the traditional orthogonal arrangement of buildings, but is still able to respond to the orthogonal borders um, through this ground condition, allowing for a transition in flow into the public park below. Uh, so just cutting along in the third level, you can start to see those internal aggregations and their effects on the arrangement of units in private green spaces. And just zooming in, you can again see that multi-sided exterior access for light and air how, um, in each unit that's generated and how these private green spaces could be used for the residents. And then from the aggregation, multiple unit arrangements are generated within various um, living conditions, including one by ones, uh, two by ones, and then three bedroom apartments, um, so multiple options. This section highlights the structure's relationship to the ground as well as the soil integrated throughout the building. And again, those commercial pods, if I zoom in, are dug three feet into the ground, allowing those spaces to accommodate a variety of programs that can change and adapt over time. And the commercial pods are then surrounded with built-in seating, um, um, built-in seating for group gatherings that can be used by the public um, at any time. And then just to break everything down further, I have removed the surroundings and color-coded all the main components and their level of private and public purpose. So this shows access to the units and the access, since it's meant to be used for recreational purposes, um, is celebrated within the system. But the ground floor includes all the public access into the park and commercial centers and everything above this, the lighter red, is for the residents and invited people to use and enjoy. And then finally, you have these dark red private accesses off the main circulation into the units. Um, this shows the green space and it looks a little bit crazy, but it's actually very systematic in its arrangement. And like the access to the ground floor houses, the public green spaces and everything above it is for the residents to enjoy and share. And then the dark green spaces um, are areas generated from that internal shift that I talked about before. Um, so this is both green spaces and access put together and you can see how it's all systematically placed and all of these components have an integrated duality where they both act functionally as a space for access or nature, but also a space for human enjoyment. So technically, this is all the human space designed uh, for human enjoyment within the projects. Most of the green space besides those uh, privacy planter buffers and a few rooftop parks are accessible to humans to access and hang out on. So just filling in the gaps, here's access green space and human space put together. Um, and then finally, here's the unit types embedded within the projects, situating themselves as uh, like sculptures within the landscape generated. And you can see the variation created from those internal shifts, the variety of units uh, generated. And then there's these two commercial pods at the bottom in the more public space. So this is everything all color coded together in one diagram. Um, but just remember that a lot of the elements should technically be colored in multiple colors due to that embedded duality that um, that is human space. Um, and now just going back to that original translate, here's before and here's after. So you can see all the, here's just a close up. Um, here you can see all the green and uh, circulation added to that transect that wasn't there before. Um, just looking at access, here's before and here's after. So that access is now celebrated and used as like a human spot, not just getting from point A to point B. Um, and then it allows for the public to have a new point of human space. Um, and then here's just the void space before and after. Um, and again, this really just changes that portion of the transect where now you are and filling that space with green and human space that wasn't there before. Um, okay, so to better visualize the experiential, aspect, experiential aspects of the project, I have a set of renders. Um, this is the first one that highlights the public ground condition. This ground condition incorporates gravel paths that run throughout the public space, allowing for a recreational area to walk, bike, and hang out from the public. And this was inspired by the Hike and Bike Trail, which is one of my favorite places to go in Austin. Um, and then you can see all the activity going on within the commercial pods, um, as well as the circulation above for an extra layer of outdoor recreation. And it's all infilled with vegetation. And then moving over to this commercial pod, um, this render highlights the advantage from that dug in com um, commercial pod, allowing for these steps to be generated to accommodate group gatherings um, for like concerts and outdoor meetings located right off of Guad. And then moving into the network of ramps, you can see how you'd be immersed into all this layers of vegetation and endless pathways to stroll around on. And on the ramps, you would have the option to walk on grass or the concrete based on your preference. And then this again shows that offset for the circulation embedded that allows light and air to move through the structure, but still provides a level of shade necessary for the hot um, Texas climate. 
here's a moment of pause and reflection embedded into the network of ramps. So as you walk along, you have the option to continue or to stop in these areas to relax and enjoy the nature. And again, you can see the benefits of those offsets here in the vegetation buffers that allow for privacy and a way to incorporate nature into the project. Um, and then this is what it would feel like going to your unit. So this would be a one bedroom apartment where you would have a privacy, um, a private balcony and plenty of surrounding nature. So it truly, truly feels like you're living in a park. And then in addition, you would have these hanging vines added to all the rooftops, gener generating an awareness that you're actually living under the soil, as well as acting as a form of passive heat mitigation in addition to the soil on top. Um, and this also highlights how that ramp is connected um, to the circulation. Um, here's a render of a private green space generated from that internal rotation. And this one happened to aggregate as a private space shared by two units. Um, in this space, you could host more private functions like private gardens or small private hangouts. Um, and then finally, just to end the presentation, here's a view from the rooftop infinity pool in which you would get a view of the generated landscape, as well as a view of UT's office and campus in the backgrounds. And again, you can see those vines allowing the green space to flow down from the rooftops in an organic way. And through this form of aggregation, nature is able to be vertically incorporated in a park-like environment um, within a functional living condition. Uh, thank you. And I'm happy to go back to any of the slides to hear your feedback. Thank you, Ben. I can go first if nobody is <laughs> taking the ground. Thank you, Ben. Um, I actually very much enjoy listening to you because I feel such a joy when the, for yourself. It's incredible. You feel so happy, you know, presenting, which is rare condition on the finals. So somehow, thank you for that. Um, and I mean, this is a key somehow to find, you know, something that you can count in studies and uh, something that you uh, probably will follow up in your, um, in your career. And I, I've seen your project and I know that you are passionate about it. And I still suspicious, you know, about the lighting condition underneath the, the ramps and I'm still suspicious about the length of the ramps, but I feel like it would be a good time for you to enter the numbers in the project. And really, I would like to hear more if you have them. If not, please consider maybe for yourself, you know, to start to understand the ratios. So how many living units you have, you know, how many kilometers of, of the ramps you produced here, you know, in because your project is such a, a strong expression of this, um, relationship between the domestic and the city scale. You know, it really collapses the brief very well, but also it really is visualized so strongly, you know, how the city directly um, attaches to my own facade, you know, or to my own garden. So I really think that it's a, it's a good point for you to, um, yeah, rationalize it and, and start to understand, you know, so if, if that's the cost, you know, if that's the, the proposition uh, to extend to this uh, insane cycling park, you know, how, what, what are the arguments and, you know, what are the ratios? I, I really cannot evaluate it. I would like to, to understand, you know, how many people would live and what kind of people. We talked about it already on other projects a bit. I think that very well also um, fits to you. But one specific thing that I want to reinforce again, uh, especially because of this collapse of the public space and domestic space one-to-one -one, is in your project is the weathering. You know, the weathering as such um, and uh, the timeline. I really wish to see, you know, your thoughts, how you think these things are aging and how they perform in bad weather. Or let's say not necessarily bad as such, but how these things get beautiful over time, you know? And I feel like because you create so much of outdoor spaces and that's probably true to others, but to understand how you live within the weather, it's very important. And I really, um, yeah, congratulate you for this passion that you have uh, for your project. And I really hope that you can think about it, you know, when, 
whenever you continue your work with such kind of designs. Thank you. So just continuing with the with the previous comment, uh, I I think you have achieved a great uh, again like a, a great variety of spaces and scales and and granular of the project and the variety of the granularity of the project I think it's is great. Um, to me, like three key elements in which uh, probably next steps you could take into account. First one is that you are using the the circle no as a as a sort of is is a form that. Uh, has um, a very specific quality. One of them is that it's isomorphic, no, and and therefore um, I, I wonder how do you uh, how you are able to somehow uh, have a dialogue in between the conditions of the environment, which are not isomorphic, with the, with the shape in itself, no. So probably this you could explain it a bit more, or probably this demands to break this rigidity of the circle or to the form or to or somehow. Um, um, take into account this this issue. Now, the second point has to do with this, with something which it seems that you capitalize a lot, which is this uh, peripheral uh, rams, no, in which you were circulating. Uh, you were using the friends of the Alexandra Road, uh, where you can see in there. I would in London. I would say that there is way more pressure on the on the street that is in the middle in itself. No, so I think it's a great idea to have the circulation going uh, up and down. But I would. I would try to to increase the the density of activity that is happening adjacent to it, no? Because now, of course, you need to separate from the building for questions of privacy, and it's that the, these rams they become uh, disconnected from from what is uh, going on, no? And the last point has to do with water. I mean, it seems that here again is something specific of your project in which it seems that that you give a certain importance to the fact that there is water and I would push you here as well. Uh, as, as we were doing other comments uh, in relation to the greenery, we could do it as well with the water, no? which, which are the other uses probably more operative and more performative that uh, we can give to the, to the water in, in such a urban spaces. No? Also in terms of humidity, temperature, no? how can we use these resources um, for, for more um, benefits than the ones that are strictly contemplative, no? But besides that, I think is a is a great uh, project, especially in spatial terms. Thank you so much. Well, there's obviously an enormous amount of effort that you've put into this uh, project, and so you know, in terms of the renderings, um, I, I want to acknowledge that uh, they are very impressive. When it comes to the actual relationship, for example, between your analysis of the transect and uh, the consequences for your project, I, I'm afraid I, I think that there's a problem because um, while you acknowledge the problem of access and you've characterized the individual nature of uh, all the development along the um, 24th Street, um, Yours is also uh, an, an island complex, uh, even though at ground level you have um, perm uh, permeability. You know, I, I think that um, I don't know what makes this more human than the other schemes. And the other schemes have uh, frontages; some of them have shops. Um, uh, if anything, I mean, um, it's already been pointed out by Indre that you have a lot of uh, um, perimeter surface and you're allowing, it seems to me, uh, everybody to go up those ramps, right? Or are there going to be access controls uh, somewhere? I, I made it designed to be only for the residents, but that's okay. because well, of the location. That's, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. But still, you know, you have residents roaming around yes. uh, all these houses, yes. right? But let me just say one, one concluding, and there's a lot of the things that we've already talked about uh, this um, session, uh, I think hold true also in your case. But I think in your case specifically, um, you're very eloquent, but you are also, you, I think you're beginning to believe the narrative that you're telling 
And I don't think you are being precise about the choice of your words in relation to your architecture. I think that the, that is very, very common amongst architects. You know, they talk about streets in the air and Rue Corridor and all things like that. And uh, these are ways of uh, using metaphors to uh, ameliorate uh, things that they can't really control. So um, I think precision in the use of concepts and words and in the end, architectural uh, elements is absolutely key. And uh, I, I, I've stopped making notes while you were speaking because there were so many instances where I would say, wait a minute, you know, uh, so, um, it, yeah, I think it's one thing, let's not diminish the need to be passionate and to, to be enthusiastic, you know, throughout the semester uh, uh, under difficult circumstances, very clearly, right, so kudos for that. But at the same time, uh, use your intelligence, use your critical faculties to interrogate what you're doing and uh, why you're doing it and whether you're actually achieving what you want to do. And I think those things aren't quite there between the narrative and your design. That makes sense. Thank you for that feedback. Hi, Ben. Um, thanks for, for the project. And I, I also appreciate the, the amount of effort. It seems like you, know, you have a really uh, complete presentation. And in your case, um, it's interesting that it's one of the first projects that we've seen that the maybe the perspective views seem to argue better for the project than the uh, the syntactical exercise or the, the syntactical kind of field condition arrangement uh, that is done prior. Uh, and I think I go back to Jordi's point, which has to do uh, with the with the selection of a circle uh, being this kind of symmetrical unit that uh, its only capacity for syntax is really displacing them, like displacing the cores, right, between concentric circles. And and I was, I, I felt like you had a unit originally, like earlier in your studies, which I'm looking at in Miro, which was kind of a lot more, a lot stronger in its capacity to create difference. And it's this kind of semicircle that, that is com uh, comprised of two units that seem to be rotating in a, in, in a, in a central axis, right? And I felt like that unit had a, a, an incredible potential in its capacity to kind of create in its own articulation, a series of kind of syntactical moves that I could see starting to scale into a larger aggregation. Um, obviously the, the next point starts hinting to what you will do later, which is you start kind of breaking the the kind of the axis of rotation, allowing parts that are stuck on top of each other to really be displaced, and, and that you know it takes you later to the to the to the circle in a way it seems. Um, but I feel like, you know, and maybe I'm talking about the studio as a whole. I feel like there's a great kind of strength of the study on the syntactical moves, and there, 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 there needs to be a precision for which moves sometimes take us away from an organization that potentially could be coherent uh, or potentially towards a kind of a very convergent sense of space where, where we might be using forms such as a circle that might kind of end up creating uh, a repetition of qualities or other ones that maybe break symmetries or kind of are able to kind of create a, maybe unexpected dialogues between units, which is what I'm most interested about in the studio, right? Like these syntactical moves sometimes might appear random but in many moments, I feel that like we can gravitate towards the unexpected encounters and dialogues that they establish with one another. So even if parts of the project might not make sense in a complete narrative, I think that there's a lot of really valuable moments. So I, I kind of celebrate that in, after the fact of, of transitioning to the circle, you have managed to kind of pull off these this kind of uh, beautiful experiential shots. Um, but I feel like the in, in every project, I feel like the, the accuracy or kind of the outcome really comes from the how how precise those syntactical studies uh, were developed and and, put, and and the potential of the geometry that you're working with. So, I would reconsider some of those. I mean, I know that you're finishing now, but like um, in, in a future experiment where you are or design that you are using such syntactical moves as a generative approach, I would reconsider uh, units that might have. Uh, more capacity to create dialogue with each other um, with certain forms of asymmetry. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you for that feedback.
Okay, I have seen one more review joint uh, our presentation. Thank you very much for comments and thank you for staying um, longer. If you can, if you if that is possible, um, we a little bit. We have uh, one more project. Um, now it's maybe two thirty, but um, we are kind of comparing to the first uh, session. Very good with time. So um, I would like to ask. Jaden, could you please share your your presentation? Yes. Present us, please. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you all for staying around. I know we are a little bit. Can you hear me? Okay. I know we are over time, so I really appreciate you guys sticking around for all your feedback today. So my name is Jaden, and my project is titled City Forest. And the precedent study I looked at was VM Houses in Copenhagen by Big. And what really attracted me to this project was the angularity of the units and how they created different viewpoints from the interior of the building as well as the exterior. And as I moved into my individual um, my individual unit creations, which were between the endless, between the plates and between the rooms, that angularity still stuck with me through the between the plates unit and this triangular form in the middle, as you can see. So then in Unity, I arranged them in a stack. And what I really liked in this exploration was the tiered effect that it created when they were pushed and pulled in different directions. And in a field, it created these interesting gaps and open spaces between all the units and these interesting spaces where they overlap as well, the units themselves. And this is the animation of what that would look like. And so I started by finalizing the Angular unit, which I settled on a form which was a variation of my initial study, which had a tiered green space on every level to keep the feel of being in a forest throughout the unit. And on the first floor, every unit at its entrance has a green space with ample soil depth to provide a space for a personal garden, customizable to the wants and needs of the occupant. And every unit on the second floor has its own balcony and green space, which adds a secondary layer of natural leaf to the bedroom. And I wanted to incorporate this because all of the large student housing buildings in West Campus are just concrete boxes with windows that don't even open. So I really wanted to accentuate this indoor outdoor feel within the units themselves. And again, I was really interested in this tiered arrangement that the Unity Explorations gave me. And also in this Unity Exploration, the semicircle that was brought here and the open courtyard space in the middle is what I really focused on. And I didn't take the unity as a literal definition of form, but more as a guideline for how I should arrange the units themselves. So this is the final semicircular tiered arrangement of the units. It is two units tall with a green space on top of the second floor, which acts as a multifunctional space where occupants can go to be in nature, like they're in a forest in the middle of a city. The green rooftops of each unit allow for these unique spaces in between the second floor units, which adds natural relief on a smaller scale in addition to the larger park on the top. So I'm referring to these intermediary spaces in between the units. So my site I chose is the empty lot on 24th Street. In this image, the previous building is still there, but at the moment it is an empty lot with construction going on. So I had free space to arrange my project. Although there is this one uh, small strip mall at the top right corner of this box where it says Sushi Nichi. Um, and this is one of the small public spaces that exists on 24th Street. So I wanted to definitely incorporate more of that into my project. And this is the overall form, which is a layering of those semicircular arrangements on the site. And one idea I really wanted to focus on was porosity and density. So right now it is located on an empty lot and 
even that empty lot was way more successful in my opinion when walking by it than the previous building that was there beforehand because it was a very tall dark brown brick building that wasn't very pleasing so as i incorporated these views from 23rd which is a street below it and 24th which is this street that it is on here um, it mimics many of the pathways that you can take within a forest with the porosity through the building itself. So this is a roof plan and I arranged it as the left side is a section of office units that can be rented out to individuals and companies in Austin. It is the same units as the residential on the right, but it is formatted differently on the inside to allow for office space as opposed to living. And this is a plan view of a small portion of the bottom right section. And here, the same process was used with the navigation on the units, as well as the navigation on the ground floor, which was just extrusions of geometry from the units themselves to create pathways. And in this elevation, you can see the porous spaces throughout, which allow for views from both sides of the project. Tiered stacking of the circular arrangements was intentional in order to allow more views when walking from Guad West on 24th Street, because I didn't want the street to feel super enclosed and claustrophobic. So I wanted it to be tiered back sort of like a slope so that you weren't feeling claustrophobic as you walked down the street. And this is a section where you can see the interior of the units themselves. And this diagram shows my project situated on its site and how it incorporates more green, which was very present towards this side of the project, the west side. And I wanted to incorporate more as well as drawing the public space from this side into the west. And this is a closer up version of that. This diagram shows circulation in the transect. And as a, you can see, as opposed to the orthogonal navigation, that exists in most of the other buildings that are near it. This was more of a meandering forest-like navigation, which allows people to walk in between the pathways and move around like they're in a forest. This diagram shows public space, and this was very important for me to consider because you can see how most of the high density public spaces in red are towards Guad on the left side. And I wanted to definitely incorporate more of those into my project. And this just shows the private space and the units themselves. So this is a view looking west on 24th Street. And as you can see, even though the building is very strong in its geometry with its angular form, the arrangement of the units creates a softer mountain-like structure rather than an orthogonal tall apartment complex. And this is one of the large commercial spaces on the bottom floor, which I wanted to be a grocery store because we really don't have any of those in West Campus. Some more necessities that students need to live, as well as a gym because there is the public gym on campus, I mean, UT gym, um, but I thought this was very necessary for people in West Campus as well. And this shows the front entrance to the whole structure. And in the back, there's another third commercial space for co-working for people to, for students from the unit and from the school to go work, as well as extrusions from these uh, semicircle units down to the ground floor, which create these kind of like a food park where you have many different food vendors, which can be interchanged because they're all the same unit on the inside to different vendors as well as these gaps in between the arrangements which create sitting spaces and outdoor natural relief as well. And this is just on the front. And this is the view of one of the of the top unit top arrangements where you can see the pathway on the top as well as the park that is there and all the views that come from it. And this is the same if it was in the evening time. And one thing that was really important was this render highlights that in between space that is formed by stacking these semicircular arrangements. And this is a space where people can do yoga or be able to get out of their bedrooms and into nature without having to go far from their bedroom. 
And that is what I have. Thank you, Jaden. Thanks, Jaden. Um, if I may jump in, I, I, I very much agree with your description of how the building manages through its form and through the kind of sequencing um, to kind of dissolve uh, a, a notion of, of kind of a more monolithic building. And I think that this, this is, for me, certainly one of the most successful projects that we've seen today in, this, in, in, the, in the actual articulation of these, uh, of the blurring of the building, the kind of the granularity, how you know the the rhythms that it manages to create through these arches, but also the the general slope that the building starts producing. Um, I find that it, it really kind of uh, works very well. Um, it doesn't seem to be an excessive amount of circulation, and those are kind of weaved very kind of cleverly through um, also strips of green. Um, so uh, I, I find that the, the spaces that you're producing are incredibly rich. Um, I'm, as I mentioned in other projects, I, I'm not a big fan of these kind of super like hyper-realistic representation that, that we, we seem to be seeing today, like especially towards the final production, but I gravitate towards the kind of bird's eye view, the isometric view that you have, which I find it's, it's a beautiful, really beautiful uh, drawing. Um, with a very kind of um, well-balanced relation between the units and, and their disposition of public space. And it really kind of takes you to, to envision a form of almost living in a forest kind of condition, which I think that is what the studio has also been pursuing, which I, I would say that maybe we haven't talked too much about ambience and atmosphere and, and mood uh, that is achieved. And I think your project really transports us to a different kind of qualities that that are perhaps less economical in terms of the, the vocabulary that we have towards architecture, but, but really describe a kind of a different sensibility for, uh, for a building, which I, I think that, and I hope that the studio continues to develop over time. So uh, thank you for, for a fantastic presentation on a beautiful project. Thank you. Okay, so if I might jump here, um, so I also I, I agree. I mean, it in, in terms of um, spatial variety and grain is a it's a great uh, approach. Uh, three three comments more for um, for for keep thinking on them and and, and for next uh, steps in your in your career. The first one is that since you were mentioning in your title word forest. Uh, but then in your when you explain it, you always speak about the garden, no? And of course. Um, to, to explore the differences between forest and garden, the, the symbiosis that usually uh, characterize a forest uh, in option to the garden that, as its etymology suggests, is something uh, we more enclosed, although, of course, we have the, the work of uh, Gilles Clement, Planetary Garden or Gardening Movement, that could suggest other views, but I would, I would ask you to, to explore a bit more this this, uh, these two approaches, since it seems that uh, it plays a, a big role in your in your project. The second one is that uh, it's, it was interesting to see that in the previous project, we were emphasizing the circle, which is the lack of angles per excellence. And, and this project instead seems to celebrate the angle precisely, no? And, and in this sense, I, I would push you to, well, especially I, I've seen many acute angles, which I think is I mean, it's a, it's a difficulty, but it's also an opportunity. And I would, I would uh, suggest you to, to see which kind of um, opportunities for occupation uh, provides this geometrical particularity, because we all know that it's easy to, to distribute uh, an inhabitational space when, when we have these sort of angles. But of course, this opens, it's opens a, a big field of, of research here. Finally, there were some images that I really enjoyed, especially the ones inside, but it, it was paradoxically suggesting a kind of uh, ruins, no? with these huge concrete masses that seems to be colonized by the, by the greenery. It's, it's, only the, it's the only moment where it seems to be a certain decay, but a scene that is a decay that, that benefits the project, no? because suddenly the, 
the 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 project doesn't look that um, sectorized as for example uh, is in the in the plan no so um yeah from this point of view i think it was a a, a good point there i don't know if it was uh, conscious or on purpose or not but uh, i think there is there uh, uh, room for for exploration so yeah great great work thank you thank you i would like to connect to jordi's acute angles uh command because this is something I was considering in your project quite important. As you set it up, Jaden, in the beginning, the idea of really looking from inside and outside into the unit. And so you already have embedded in, in the interior this kind of uh, moments where they, let's say, they cannot be standardly inhabited, right? So therefore, they I see also potential here of, you know, like proposing a specific articulation of these moments. And to my interpretation would be perfect uh, um, occasion or a uh, moment for this, uh, um, let's say not so functionally, classically functionally inhabitable spaces to become these spaces what, um, what the forest could do for you, you know, to create a certain uh, um, depth and to create a certain um, elevation in the in the forest. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, what it lacks a bit yet, though. Again, uh, congratulations! You pushed the projects from the last couple of weeks. I've seen a lot, but I feel like it still lacks the understanding of the forest forest in its uh, elevational qualities. And I, um, I think that when we see the plan, you know, it's very critical that you have a lot of these moments which seem in, uh, in yeah, sort of redundant. But uh, my, my consideration would be really to work with that idea that you have a certain depth of the space and to really consider, um, to leave that hyper-realistic presentation now of, you know, what you have library trees but to really conceptualize the depth of the space, you know, through abstract greenery and to really think, you know, what, how can you um, sort of create the biotops in a way, in that way. Um, and yeah, I think that it's really, um, really powerful project. Sometimes I also thought that maybe you could even densify the rotational angle of your units, you know, in order to achieve a certain smoothness and transition. So this kind of angularity still allows you to somehow create a different stepping. And it's very obvious when we go in a section, you know, that it could allow for, let's say, more sensitive stepping. So it's more like speculations what could be done, but I think it's also a sign that it triggers imagination. And I really appreciate your work. Thank you. I agree with that very much. Thank you. I think one of the fundamental issues uh, that we have to address um, is what we mean by forest, what we mean by nature. When you explain in your um, one of your final perspectives, um, a group of uh, people uh, out on a terrace uh, doing yoga, you said they're able to go into nature without having to go far. Uh, and nature is not just a piece of lawn, right? It's uh, untouched by humans. That is what nature is. Uh, so there isn't much nature left in the world, frankly. What we have is landscape um, design, landscape architecture. And of course, um, uh, green helps a lot to uh, improve the quality of life. That's not, a, that's not the question. But there's a difference between uh, a landscaped uh, environment and uh, a natural environment. So that said, is, um, I'm wondering whether you've come across uh, Hans Scherwohl's uh, housing project, uh, Romeo, uh, Romeo and Julia in uh, Stuttgart, where um, one of the schemes, uh, there are two housing uh, elements. One is a high rise tower, a point tower with uh, polygonal uh, geometry, and the other is a kind of a radial fan-shaped element with um, also um, pointed balconies and so on. Uh, the interiors are quite polygonal, uh, and um, it uh, has many positive things. It sort of allows uh, inhabitants to take full advantage of the views around that um, site, which is uh, overlooking a forest. 
but it also has a drawback and that is the uh, uh, inside of the um, the interior drum space, so to speak. And when you go to your perspectives, um, that is one aspect that uh, you also have to deal with. And in some instances, you can deal with them. Mm -hmm. but, but what I was going to suggest, uh, and, you know, we've been very um, liberal about the use of trees on top of terraces. And we know that some trees need more than just three feet of soil. In your case, you actually got um, interstitial spaces such as this that could be used uh, not as a terrace, um, as an open space, but actually a container for trees uh, to grow in between the units. And so if, if this were to be a kind of a, an ongoing project, the idea of a kind of a fan-shaped rotational uh, series of units um, that open up uh, vestigial or leftover spaces for, say, terraces such as this, or deep planters for real trees, then I think that that's kind of the next step that you could take it to, um, combined with an idea of a, a terrace section. Um, so, you know, the two typologies of kind of radiating a fan-shaped uh, arrangement and uh, a stepping section uh, would be I think worth pursuing as a, as a kind of long-term project. Um, but I think one needs to give trees a, a real chance to grow uh, and not just um, treat them as uh, add-ons in a kind of a Photoshop uh, mm -hmm. you know, perspective number. Yeah, I agree, thank you. I'm afraid I have to go. Uh, um, all the best. Thank you very much and uh, good luck with uh, everything else. Thank you, Professor Vang, for staying with us so long. I'm just a guest, but uh, I've just joined again because over the year I've always like followed a bit the studio. <coughs> get back in the way from the first session. Okay. Uh, I want to thank you to everyone, to Jose Sanchez, for Indre, and Jordi Vivaldi, and professors uh, joining us along today. And especially we, we were excited to share with you our experiments we also had a hard um, semester, some interruption, the vendor cold coming here in Texas, which was abnormal for all of us and interrupted our semester. I want to thank you for students being so brave and experimenting and trusting this pathway to take those uh, conventional um, entities such as ordered access um, and uh, ordered um, human leftover pieces, uh, fragmental pedestrian zones and widen it, embed it, research with it and dynamic systems uh, to highlight within the human void and human movement and human possibility of the flow in, uh, rather than being restricted. We're showing this vision for West Campus as it's a campus and close to university to embed such uh, subjects and showing also visions with your own passion to the outdoor and indoor activities uh, within the campus maybe it's lacking for. So I'm very much thankful for our jury for the great insights and learning. We always learn to hear these comments, um, rethink our results and also bringing that knowledge within this discussion for the future, for next semester, for your ideas, um, your interest also in future in architecture. It was amazing, it was very interesting, it was intriguing also to rethink all those aspects we have done and trying to embrace from urban, environmental and architecture proposal at the end. Um, thank you very much for joining us also from far away and for some of you a very, very late evening. And I really appreciate and from all our students' side that you stayed with us 
and I'm sorry for that delay. Thank, thanks for having me, Wes. It's been great to, to see the work of your students and everybody thank you for, for sharing today. Thank you, Raza, from my side as well. It was, it was a great uh, work, very inspiring. Thank you very much. And congratulations to all the students as well. Great work, guys. Yes, congratulations to everyone. Not to feel discouraged. Housing is like the, you know, the most difficult architect job. That's why there are not so many good projects, as you know. And those great architects who do housing often fail. So. Don't feel discouraged by anything and just keep up the hard work. It's a lot of good material. And yeah, um, hopefully you share all the comments and don't reserve just to your own project and understand that a lot of things said were meant to, you know, to the entire, entire sort of group. Thank you very much and greetings to everyone from Europe. <laughs> So we will say goodbye to our guests and goodbye to Vienna, <laughs> to Europe and to Michigan. <laughs> and uh, it was really exciting to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you.